Hey guys, uh, Chopadong here. It is Wednesday, hump day, April 14th, and I'm going to try and just turbo through a uh, MLB quick pick kind of situation here, show you the pitchers, show you the hitters that I'm keying on, and cover the trends tab since I promised we would do that this week. Um, but I'm going to be really, really quick. I won't dive into stacks and domination station and stuff. All I'm looking for right now, I really, really rely on our MLB leverage stacks tool. And while I'm waiting for ownerships and things like that to pop out, I'm just getting an idea, getting a feel for what I might be looking for later today, what I'm hoping to see later. But I'm keeping a very, very open mind towards making any kind of switch that I see the need to make um, as things open up throughout the slate. So keep that in mind with me. Sorry, this is a little bit smaller, but I want to show you the basic idea here in the pitchers tab. Well, we cut off the times, cut off all the early times so that you only get the main slates if that's what you're playing. Sort K score by descending. If you haven't seen the video, ask me for it. I can link it for you. It's probably pinned in a channel somewhere. Uh, but K score is simply the pitcher's strikeout percentage combined with the opponent's strikeout percentage as a team. And it's trying to identify a high strikeout pitcher facing a high strikeout team for a lot of strikeout potential and vice versa, low on low. We're looking for spots to target for pitchers. We're looking for spots to avoid in rostering pitchers because we don't want to necessarily roster every single pitcher on the slate. Um, I'm finding that a lot of the winning lineups are carrying very, very high chalk pitchers. So you could almost just use ownership and take five, six, you know, a bigger slate, you know, five, six, seven of the top owned pitchers on a smaller slate, maybe four or five of the top owned pitchers and just let those guys rip and X everybody else out. You're not usually missing too much when you do that. You are going to see outliers throughout the year, but generally speaking, these are the guys that are in the winning lineups this week or the, these days. So uh, K score does help us identify that we can see a weaker slate tonight. Numbers usually over 500 are good and we're seeing numbers in the 600s early in the year on a lot of slates with multiple pitching options. And today is just not going to be that. So that could also tell us maybe we see another high scoring slate in terms of a lot of people knocking the ball around the park, but that puts please sack Dunn, McCullers, Dustin may, these guys are up towards the top. We're going to look for ownership. We're going to look for other factors in terms of who of these guys we might eliminate, but Generally speaking, I won't be surprised to see any of those guys in my lineups tonight. I'm going to look down here towards the bottom, though, at these higher W scores. This is batting. This is high WOBAs versus a pitcher that, you know, or in, in this case, this is a, a, a pitcher that allows a high WOBA going up against a team that hits for a high WOBA. That suggests damage. And I can see here that Matt Harvey's been giving up a lot of damage, and that's probably true the past couple of years. I can see these pitchers down here giving up a lot of damage. So immediately I'm looking for those matchups. You know, who are they? I'll show you when I scroll back over. But the other thing that I'm looking for is in this stats column, the Sierra whip home run per nine and walks per nine walks per nine. That's free bases. That's allowing people on base for other players to knock in home run per nine. Self-explanatory. A big number means the pitcher gives up a lot of home runs. A high whip is walks and hits per innings pitched, which means he gives up a lot of base runners via the hit or via the walk. And Sierra is what a pitcher should be pitching to in terms of ERA. So that takes a little bit of the luck out and say, you know, if the guy's pitching at a 2.5 and his Sierra is a six, it tells us he's going to regress towards that six. I want pitchers with high Sierras. Those guys tell me they're not quality pitchers in a lot of cases. When they have other factors like whip and home run per nine and walks per nine going along with that story, I start to believe that story and I target that narrative. So I'm looking for a lot of reds, and today we should see quite a bit on this slate. I see high numbers up here for Justin Dunn. I see some big numbers for Matt Harvey, which, again, with the W score, sells the story. I see a little bit down in here that might kind of shy me off a little bit of like a Zach Wheeler type, but down in here, a lot of neutrals and a lot of reds for these bottom three donkeys down here again. So what I'm looking for is who am I targeting along those lines? I'm looking for not the team they pitched for. I'm looking for the opponent. These are guys that I would consider stacking. Baltimore, I would consider stacking them just on Sierra alone for Justin Dunn. Come down here to old Matt Harvey. That's Seattle. So we could get a game stack scenario. Baltimore, Seattle shootout makes some sense. Come down here to the bottom guys, Gray, Fulmer. And I, I don't know about Gray. He's facing LA. I'd look for BVP and things there to see if LA specifically touches him up. 
I know that John Gray tends to go for a little bit more contact on the road, tends to strike out players at home, tries to get the swing and miss type stuff at home because he doesn't want the ball being put into contact in Coors Field. That's, he's inter, been interviewed as saying such, so he might pitch the contact tonight, which means L.A. might touch him up a little bit. Might be a decent contrarian stack because L.A. might come in a little lower owned because John Gray is a name. Therefore, the public may kind of shy away from the Dodgers a little bit. They won't shy completely away. They'll probably still be a chalky stack. But we're looking at s- scenarios where a team can break the slate, but its ownership is not high enough to suggest – you know, they're still under-owned compared to their chances of breaking the slate. When you see that, you want to be overweight the field on that. This might be a night, might be. We need to see ownership, but it might be a night to look for some Dodgers tonight. Even if they're 30 and 40% owned, if they've got a 50% chance of breaking the slate, you want to be overweight on them. Does that make sense? That's a key concept in MLB DFS. So, Fulmer's another one against Houston. I would look him up. I know that he carved up somebody like Minnesota or whatever at the last start out because he had bad he Minnesota had bad BVP against him. And even the baseball announcers for Minnesota were saying, well, there's uh, Fulmer doing what he did to us last year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe we got that scenario again. I do look for BVP to see how these guys do specifically handle them. And it helps me say, yeah, I want a little more of these guys, or no, I'd like to back off them a little bit. Maybe the public is wrong. Like I see, If I see a chalky stack with bad BVP running through it, or even average BVP running through it, I'm going, man, I, I, I might go underweight the field here and hope for the flop. That's, again, another way to maintain or to gain a little bit of leverage on the field in these GPPs. Um, I hear a Tampa Bay. So Tampa Bay, Houston, L.A., um, Seattle and Baltimore are stacks. I would expect us to see a few of them gain leverage, a few of them be suggested stacks today. Okay. Doesn't mean the others should be eliminated. It just means these are the ones that I expect to see. The next thing I'm going to do is come over towards the trends tab. And I want to show you this briefly because this is a very important tab for me. The more the season goes on, I love this tab. Woba trends. ISO trends are big for me, and I use a little bit of math here that I'm going to show you. But I love the 7-day and 14-day numbers. 30-day and the 19 to 21 numbers are okay. They're larger samples. They form good baselines, and that's great. But I want who's hot now. And I did a little bit of reading last night, and I found a really neat article that I might uh, I might start talking about a little bit more that did suggest that a 5-day moving average um, of a hitter like a Mookie Betts, when he's in the 10 to 15 point range, he does continue to carry that streak on for a little while. His sixth game or his seventh game is usually decent as well. It just shows you when guys are rolling, they roll well. Do they live forever on these high Wobos and high ISOs? No, of course not. But when you can catch them hot, they tend to carry that trend for a little bit. And if you can catch them hot early, they tend to outpace their pricing. Their production is way above the price. It takes a little while. It takes about five days for that pricing to start catching up. And then you can start talking about getting off of these guys because their price is caught up to their production and they're not creating as much value as they were before. That's the game that we play also within the game of MLB DFS. And you can use this trends tab to find that out. I can take these seven-day numbers and I can start looking for who's hot and who's not. If I come over here and I can sort by things like DFSA rating um, and whatever else, or at least I used to be able to, I can also just sort by the team and just flat out stack them up. And if I go by ascending order here, I can bring Atlanta to the top, Baltimore, and just go alphabetically. And I can look at the teams that I was wanting to target. Like Atlanta was not mentioned, you know, but I might include, you know, someone like Acuna. Acuna's ripping the cover off the ball. You can see here with a straight green line across all of the numbers, right? Um, Ozuna, you know, I'm looking for guys that if if your 14-day is below your 7-day, you might be on the uptick. So he was hitting 271 over 14 days. Now he's hitting 310. He might be on the uptick, 235 and 337. Now, those are not numbers I look for. In WOBA, I'm looking for numbers 400 and above. And on a shorter sample, even 5 and 600. Acuna is definitely one I would target as a one-off if I'm not stacking Atlanta tonight. That's just one way to interpret this chart. I come down to Baltimore, and this is a team I might be stacking. I'm looking for guys I might – I don't see anybody really rolling hot, so it's a little bit scary, right? You might have to stack them a little bit on blind faith. You might cut your exposure to them and say, I don't have any faith. There's all sorts of ways you can play this. 
But if Baltimore ends up being a recommended stack, I'm going to need to see some reasons as to why. I saw a high W score. I saw a weak pitcher. Those are good signs. But I don't see who I would target in the stack. So I may just let them all filter in there and hope that I get the right mix of four or five guys, depending on the side I'm playing on. Come down to Chicago. Same diff. Well, we got a couple guys in seven-day Wobas recently that looks like Bryant, Contreras, and Baez. Might be starting to heat up a little bit. But see, the thing is that 370 and 360 is still not very high, right? I want a team here, like the 400s. Who's that? Chicago White Sox, Mendick, Eden, and Vaughn. I mean, these are not names that you're going to see a lot of around the industry. So that might be a low-owned mini stack that you might use. This is just a way to interpret these numbers. Down here in Cincinnati, Suarez and Winker. Winker heating up. 496 is already high for 14 days. That's a hell of a number. And it's 556 over the last seven. So he might still be ascending. He might still be too cheap for his production. So I can come down here and I can start scrolling these lists and picking up. And if I start seeing kind of like the double green light where I see, oh, my God, these guys are hot and they're in a great spot tonight. They've got high W scores, their stack recommendations. Then I'm probably going to go overweight that situation when I see it, if that makes sense. Then I'm going to scroll over here to the ISO tab and kind of do the same thing. I'm going to be looking for big numbers. 200 ISO is a big elite number, but on a short sample, I want much higher than that, right? So 300, 385, 450, 480, 200, 300. These are good. Now watch this. This 400 for Will Smith that then dropped to an 07. So he's fallen off the, path, the power map completely. His WOBA has gone from 441 to 177. The, the, until the guy turns around, he's very overpriced right now because over those 7 to 14 days, his price came up to start matching his production, and then boom, his production fell off the face of the earth, leaving him overpriced. So I would maybe even X him out of some of my stacks unless I saw some indicator or some sign watching the game or whatever that he's starting to hit the ball hard again. He's just kind of getting screwed over with line drive, you know, diving catches, etc., I'm looking for indicators, and I'm trying to piece these puzzles together. But I'm using this trend tab to show me those short-term sample sizes of who could be sitting in the middle of some good stuff here. There's Contreras and Baez and Rizzo again. Looking for some green. You know, there's a Eddie Rosario. Is that who that is, or is that Fermil Reyes? It's Fermil Reyes, who hit, what, two or three dongs the other night. That's clearly indicated in here. Down here, even lower, is, uh, can't, I guess it's Nunez, the... The lettering's a little bit messed up. Here's another one here in Wilson Ramos. These are guys you could pick off as one-offs if they're not part of your stacks. These are guys that are hitting home runs. If you want to talk about where guys score most of their fantasy points, it's in, it's not in RBIs. It's certainly not in stolen bases. Too many people chase the stolen base. The league doesn't run anymore. Ah, yeah, stolen base upside's nice. But did you realize that not much of a guy's fantasy production actually comes out of stolen bases? 25% of his production comes out of hits, and home runs, or more, maybe even 30% or more. Hits and home runs, not doubles, not RBIs, whatever. Hits and home runs. That's why we're focused on the power bats. That's why we're focused on the top of the order guys with the higher averages. That's who you're looking for. If you were going to stack from top to bottom, one through eight is fine. I would omit the number nine hole hitter, especially in the National League. These guys get pinch hit for, of course, the pitchers are pitching or hitting in the nine hole, etc. They're not usually the better players. They average, I think it is about 1.2 fantasy points per plate appearance, whereas up top, you're getting 1.7, 1.8 in some cases. That's a half a point per plate appearance, and you get fewer plate appearances. I would omit the nine hole personally. The wrap stack, fine, 812. Don't do 8912, 812. You're going to play the odds. You're going to play the law of large numbers. And over the season, that's going to pan out. Any given day, any crap can happen. That's what we're targeting here with our stacks and our matchups and whatever else. But as the season rolls on, we want to play top of the order guys. We want to play guys with high plate appearances or high points per plate appearances. We want to play guys that are underpriced as opposed to overpriced, and we want to play the game effectively. If that helps you and that gives you some things to think about, some things to look at, certainly give me a little thumb up on the video or whatever, but come into the Slack room, hit me up, tell me thank you, and we'll produce more videos like this, walking you through the tools, showing you around, kind of explaining how things work, how we might think about that, and how we might exploit our competition, because that is key to DFS. Take care, guys. Wednesday, April 14th. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.